ready. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Lynn Stanley, and I'm the Curator of Education here at the Provincetown Association of Museum. And I'd like to welcome you to tonight's 2008 Freddie Schiff Levin Lecture with artist and co-curator of the studio show exhibition, Michael Mazur. This will be the fourth of seven FSL lectures to take place this summer. We hope you'll join us for the next lecture on July 8th, entitled, entitled Echo Elegance, presented by landscape architect Priscilla Randall in conjunction with the exhibition Art of the Garden and Pam's Secret Garden Tour. And that will be going up shortly in the Moffat Gallery down the way. Ms. Randall will discuss the evolution of garden design from 15th century France and the creation of contemporary, contemporary ecologically responsible gardens. The Friendship Levin Lecture Series was begun in 2003 and is named in honor of the artist Freddie Shipman, who was a member of Provincetown Arts Community from the 1960s until his passing in 2002. Pam gratefully acknowledges uh, the generous support of Mildred and Herbert Lee and Tony and John Levin. We'd also like to thank Angel Foods for another fabulous cheese bottle. And please help yourself to refreshments and some cheese in the next gallery. Um, and now on to tonight's presentation with Michael Mazur. At the epicenter of creativity that is today's Provincetown Art Colony, Pam's 650 artist members keep studios in backyards and basements, high above treetops, and beside the same bay that the renowned white line printmaker Blanche Lazell is. Lazell, Moffat, and uncountable others first came to Provincetown to study at the studio of Charles Hawthorne, one of Pam's founders. Pam, in conjunction with the Fine Arts Work Center and the Holder Monument and Museum, have, have mounted three exhibitions that illustrate and preserve the history and faith of artist studios in Provincetown through paintings, photographs, <coughs> models, architectural plans, and other objects. By highlighting artist workspaces, Pam, Falk, and Pian Pian have underscored the importance of Provincetown as America's principal art colony for much of the 20th century. We're thrilled to welcome Michael Mazur, the co-curator of the studio show exhibition, here tonight for a gallery talk. The artist Michael Mazur's prints, drawings, and paintings have been exhibited extensively throughout the country and abroad and are included in major U.S. collections, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, the National Gallery, and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. His honors include a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Tiffany Foundation grant. He has received honorary degrees from the Art Institute of Boston and the College of Creative Studies in Detroit. He has taught at the Rhode Island School of Design, Brandeis, the Yale School of Art and Architecture, Boston University, and Harvard's Carpenter Center. He is represented by the Mary Ryan Gallery in New York, the Barbara Krakow Gallery in Boston, as well as the Albert Marola Gallery in Provincetown. Beyond Michael's enormous artistic gifts, he is also recognized for having led a life in support of artists in their careers, notably evidenced in the exhibition that has been realized this year in our gallery and the other venues that we discussed, as well as through his lifelong commitment to arts education and mentorship and his years of service at the Fine Arts Work Center. Please help me welcome my community. I hope you'll bear with me. I, I really want to read these notes because it's so easy for me to get caught up in digressions and wandering. Uh, my mind uh, sort of spreads out in that direction, and I sometimes, as they say, the politics uh, don't stay on message. Um, I want, first of all, to thank Pam and uh, Chris McCarthy, especially for encouraging being so encouraging about this show. The show was really begun when the LaZelle studio was destroyed in 2002. And that was the inception of this show, it began back then. And the museum wanted, uh, it had to wait until the new room was built before it seemed plausible to do this show. So we, we've been thinking about this show for quite a while. Um, I want to say at the outset that the goal of this show 
as you can see in the plaque uh, with Peter Bliss's name on it, is to uh, mark the buildings and the studios of artists who have um, made their reputation here, been here for quite a, quite a while during the 20th century and beyond, um, and to start in that way to raise the consciousness of people, whether they're coming in for the first time or whether they live here, um, about essentially the legacy of the work that these artists have done here. Um, we have a few marked buildings, we have writers, we have some explorers, we have uh, uh, a number of, of others, but in this case uh, there are many people who deserve to have plaques on their, on their wall and we'd like to raise money in one way or another for that particular purpose. Uh, I want to specifically point out that the photographs done here were done, large-scale photographs, most of them, many of them, were done by Amy Heller, who's here today, and to whom I owe a great debt of thanks for not just sticking with it, which was hard enough, but with producing very artful, very, very beautifully composed photographs of some of these more um, historic spaces. Um, while many of these spaces are not open for us to visit, anymore, or ever were. Um, that glimpse into that world is a fascinating one, and it's due to her, to her talents as a photographer and to others. There were several other photographers, um, but I, if I get into an acknowledgement thing, it will take up most of the time. So I'm just going to thank everyone <laughs> at Pam and uh, at the Work Center, the Fine Arts Work Center, where Bob Bailey did the exhibition that's on now, which is mainly contemporary. And especially Jim Backer up at the uh, museum, up at the monument, who did a wonderful job of fitting in uh, these artifacts and photographs into the, the style of this particular museum. And each space, which I like very much, is very much like the spaces, like the organizations that uh, uh, that include them, uh, so that it has a kind of special quality of not only of installation and attitude and personality. It's not just one enormous loan show that's going into all of these places. I'll read now and hope that I, I don't do it in uh, sort of stentorian voice and it's more casual and that I can get in notes from time to time, but not major digressions, I hope. The journey through the making of art, but this is probably uh, applied to all journeys, begins not with the first hands-on gesture, nor does it end when the work reaches closure. The inception begins even before the first concept is imagined, and lasts long afterwards. The ramifications of what was made and where it might lead, the artist is dependent on the information that is derived from his studio. In this sense, the space we inhabit, all of us, large or small, the experiences we have, intimate or global, the character of our personalities shaped by these experiences, are all a part of a particular work we display as artists. How we live is how we work, as much as the reverse. And our environment, with a capital E, the largest letter on the I chart, is the source of our imagination. This is the argument for educators in the larger sense of preparing us all for a life of imaginings. But even in the smaller world of art making, the studio, all its details, the view out its windows, its smells, its sounds, is the world of immediacy that allows us to act. What this show proposes is a new understanding of work with special attention to how the work develops before it leaves the studio. It's not to say that it's a process show, which would show the development of a particular work of art, but that we really are investigating the ambience of these works of art. For many of us, sending forth a work into the public, though a normal part of our professional practice is somewhat at odds with what ideally is involved in our studio practice. 
Motherwell, in an interview I heard years ago, claimed that nothing left his studio for at least a year. <coughs> Whether true or not, I certainly can't make that claim. I need to pay bills from time to time. But the truth in the statement has to do with doubts and standards. Sometimes the concern for standards is overstated. Because doubts exist. They always exist. Which immediately separates the artist from big business and government, most especially in our own. Gustin has said, even doubt has a form. And it is this very idea that protects an often meager, unresolved object in the studio from being prematurely trashed. Often one painting, accidentally placed next to another, causes things to happen, a kind of vibration. Diptychs and triptychs obviously occur, but more than that, they sometimes actually blend into each other. They create a new image that is a step beyond the originals. They move things forward. The studio is about forward movement. John's, Jasper John says, I do something, I do something else. Habits play an enormous part. Greenberg, on the changing of one's work, said, if you want to change your work, change your habits. Around the early 50s, a neighbor of Ben Nicholson, a British modernist, described his studio practice. Every morning Ben came in, and I could hear the scraping away of a part of all of the previous day's painting. He worked a lot on wooden supports. The artist was, I suppose, impressed, or perhaps driven crazy by the sound of it. Furthermore, there is the space itself. Large or small, it is the space of one's dreams, or of those limited areas left for the striving artists. Monet thought his studio uh, was really outside. He was a plein air painter. When it rained, he usually went to bed. He was, he was not a, a, a very devoted still life painter, and some of the worst paintings he made were uh, made during rainy days, I'm sure. Um, he, he bought the famous poplars. I don't know if you know this story. He bought the famous poplars from a farmer who kept him off his property until he bought the poplars himself. <laughs> There are many, many stories about what Monet had to go through in order to paint outside. And Durga, um, notably grumpy, proposed that plein air painters become legal targets for hunters. <laughs> <laughs> there were so many of them. Monet set up his outdoor still life in, in Giverny, his famous lily pond, of course. When, when he was commissioned to do the water gardens in the oratory, he needed a large space, and he had a barn built with enormous skylights, um, and famously hated it. A picture of him with his large canvases on rolling walls, his one piece of furniture, a soft sofa, has been a talisman in my studio for years. Uh, I get a kick out of the fact that it, it's so remarkable because you see the water lilies on these rolling walls and he sets them up in order to look like they would eventually look together, but he hates his studio anyway. <coughs> now, if you go there, you can erase the souvenirs and envision the studio. It's mostly a store for his, for his uh, group, uh, doodads. <laughs> By moving the walls, he could create that oval space that he needed. Walter Murch, a much lesser known painter and a wonderful teacher, said, um, and if you're, you're old enough, uh, many of us are here, you might remember Scientific American covers that he did in the 1960s. Um, they were fascinating and especially prized by, by artists. He had a small home studio in his apartment on Riverside Drive. It was about 12 feet long and 6 feet wide. A table against one wall, which was the dining room wall. And he had a small table easel on it. On the other wall, there were some hanging paintings, but also a Cornell box, a friend of his, and others, other artists' works or reproductions. After he died, I visited the apartment and the studio on one of the narrow walls were some images that he had cut out among them, one of mine, that I never knew that he had. It stunned me, like a word of encouragement from a good friend from the grave. 
Motherwell watched TV every day while he worked, though in a radio interview, he only mentioned listening to Mozart. <laughs> say that there is a photograph of his studio with the TV and uh, a still life of, of his in the studio with the open pages of this TV guy. <laughs> Art history has a way of covering over some of these facts. Mondrian worked on the floor fixing tape to his paintings and changing their positions. It was a small studio as were many in the crowded cities of Paris and New York but big enough as it turned out to produce masterworks. And I, I must tell you one short story. When I worked for Naomi Gabot, he told me that he had a lunch date with Piet Mondrian. And um, he came, and Mondrian was on his hands and knees putting tape on his canvases. And Gabot, the Russian, uh, said to Mondrian, the, uh, uh, the Dutchman, uh, you know, I'm a little late and I'm very hungry, let's go to lunch. And Mondrian, according to Gabot, said to him, I can't. And Gabo said, why? I'm hungry. Why? And Mondrian said, because it's not flat enough. <laughs> <laughs> some studios are empty, some crowded and cluttered. Francis Bacon, with his side room filled wall to wall with dirty papers and old pieces of canvas. His painting room, however, was filled with immaculately painted scenes of horror behind glass in very expensive gold leaf frames. It was a fashionable kind of squalor. Lucian Freud, perhaps quoting Bacon, with his pile of cream clean rags, literally eye high, his old couch and grungy bed suitable for nudes, the rags as white and clean as the rest was dusty and sweaty. And that, of course, comes out in most of the painting. Now, Gabo, who I mentioned, the great constructivist, with who I worked for a while and who introduced me to monoprint to some extent, though he didn't know what to call it then, and I hardly did. He introduced me to his studio, immaculate, a laboratory suitable to an elegant machinist. On one wall was a lone arrow, a lone arrow pointing up, filling the space. My first studio, or place to work beside my bathroom, was an art teacher's loft across beside my bathroom in terms of when I worked when I was a kid. It was an art teacher's loft across from Wanamaker's near Astor Place. I was 14 and saw my first artist studio, which set the stage for every one I imagined or sometimes worked in after that. Just an old loft, painted white, tin ceiling, dusty windows, the smell of coffee from the shop below, a single sagging bed, a mattress ticking, pillow somewhat yellowed, no case. A table, an easel, and paintings turned to the wall. My student section in an alcove was there as well, with quiet radio music, books, and catalogs. A man much younger than I am now, talking about Picasso and Matisse, was, was Alan, my teacher. When I look at the wonderful small Rembrandt of the artist in the studio at the MFA, empty as that other one that I told you about, had magical light, a large canvas turned away from us, the concentration like a laser between artist and painting, walls flaking, a single palette on one of them. A young artist's first studio. Compare that to the mature Vermeer's artist in his studio, a variant of the attributes of the artist. It used to be a very common thing in the 17th century to make paintings called attributes of the artist. And they were always very kind of glorious still lifes with medals and uh, busts and anatomical uh, uh, models and uh, uh, drawings and so forth. And it was a kind of <coughs> a kind of homage to the life of the artist. But in the premiere, there was a velvet curtain, a glow. I'm sure you know this painting, a map, a model with a loot, a laurel wreath. The studio became a metaphor for art, an imagined space. And further back, Roger van der Weyden's St. Luke drawing the Virgin. Uh, in those days, uh, although I 
can't claim to have witnessed them. Um, in the 15th century, 16th century, there were hardly any individual artist, artist studios. Uh, they were workshops, essentially, that where many artists worked together. In those days, there was actually uh, a need for paintings, believe it or not. People commissioned hundreds of still lives from Dutch painters or portraits, or landscapes, uh, or the church uh, worked very hard to get lots of material to fill the, to fill the abbeys and the churches at the time. So that artists tended to work in concert together in large rooms. Um, and one of the problems that scholars have, especially with people like Rembrandt, is that Rembrandt may have touched, or Rubens may have touched some of these paintings, and the students may have finished them, or vice versa. And so consequently, one sees this as a very collaborative notion of what a studio is like. But in this van der Rijden, and it's a remarkable gem of a painting at the Boston Museum, St. Luke looks directly at, um, at, at uh, I guess I'm at the book, 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 book. looks directly at the model, who probably was a wealthy friend of his daughter, who owned the palace in which the interior is actually depicted. She was the virgin and child, and the child was very rambunctious. But the intensity of St. Luke drawing on a small pad, and you see the portrait of the model, beautifully drawn in a very small pad that St. Luke has got in his hand. The, the effect is to completely erase the notion of the religious meaning of this painting to some extent. And if, as an artist, you look at it, you say, ah, St. Luke, patron saint of artists, St. Luke being an artist. And you see very few of those. I, I want to look it up. I should Google it in terms of seeing how many St. Luke's actually show St. Luke painting. <laughs> Back again to Matisse, and this time his red studio. His, became, his paintings become wallpaper, as in another painting, wallpaper becomes the painting. He hung his studio with beautifully colored fabrics for backgrounds, and I don't know uh, if any of you or many of you saw the show at the Metropolitan, which featured many, many of these fabrics and pictures of the studio um, with him working in it. Um, this was indeed a kind of um, work of art itself. His studios and the quality of his clothing and everything else are remarkable. No genes there. Picasso had a villa or two. It sounds like that. A limerick starting. <laughs> <laughs> Picasso had a villa or two. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, but he needed them because each room in the studio was empty but for his paintings. In other words, the rooms in his villas were really storerooms for his paintings. I want to live like a poor artist, he said, <laughs> in a rich man's house. Uh, Klimt needed a very big studio uh, because, um, and which they're actually preserving now in Vienna. He needed lots of space so many nudes could walk around. <laughs> and, <laughs> true, this is true. You know, he made wonderful drawings from the model, but these models were lounging in different parts of this big studio. I've seen pictures of it. There was one in an architectural magazine that I saw a few years ago. His poses were therefore found, not arranged. <laughs> in our show, you see Amy Heller's beautiful photo of Hoffman's studio uh, over in the other section, which is, to this day, exactly the same as when he moved in, except for the furniture. He didn't build it. The artist Frederick Wall, the marine painter, much earlier, an older generation, built that and feels like the interior of a, of a great ship. Um, in fact, there is another photograph that I'm hoping to get tomorrow um, from the person who happens to rent that studio now of Motherwell, a famous photograph of, of Hoffman teaching in that very studio. And the balcony that you see in that photograph has many of his artist studio student, students leaning over mm -hmm. to listen to him as he talks about a painting or actually gives a demonstration. You can feel in that studio a kind of leftover elegance of Waugh's nearly 19th century space where artists like Frederick Church's <coughs> studio in Olana, Victorian ornamentation, 
rugs, sculpture, heavy furniture, impressive tchotchkes from all over the world. Oh, you can Google tchotchkes. People say, did you mean? Yeah. <laughs> he, those artists used to take trips to Egypt or South America and decorate <clears throat> a place suitable, suitable for the impressionist uh, an, an impressionable visitor. <clears throat> and in fact, that was the use of the studio to some extent, as a show place. Um, the art was made there indeed, <clears throat> but it was kept impeccable and was kept available to people who were coming for dinner parties or people who just wanted to buy works. Dealers would bring them. Um, this concept um, is still true today, but for many of us, uh, it actually is a horrible idea, um, which I won't go into. Um, the public, the studio is really a private space. It was never meant, certainly in, in, my, in my working practice, to be a public space. And the very fact that one lets people into it, the see work in process, is a very complex, uh, complex problem. Because, as many artists, as many of you are, know, holding to yourself, holding this fragile idea to yourself, before it reaches resolution, if it ever does, before it reaches completion, is the most delicate, worrisome, uh, <clears throat> worrisome thing that an artist does. This protection of his imaginary or her imagination. And, um, uh, having other eyes look at the work before it's ready uh, is often a killer uh, for the dream of that particular painting. And then there's Blanche Lizelle's studio. It's now gone on the sand of the town beach. Hills Wharf Studio, it was called when she first moved in in 1918. And the model behind you is, is, um, is of that 1918 studio. You'll notice that the print that's next to it is not a shed, but a, has essentially a um, pitch roof on both sides. And we, we are sure that that was added to it in the 1930s when she started actually making images of these particular of her studio. <clears throat> she wanted to buy it. She begged her brother, or I think her brother, to be an uncle, to give her the money to buy it. But he wouldn't. Uh, he told her to get a job. <laughs> <laughs> it was added to after 1930, and is subject, like for many of the artist's paintings, uh, of many of the artist's paintings and prints. But look how cold it looked right? back in this photograph. Unheated. The uh, chimney was added sometime later. Uh, and this was quite common. Um, artists in Provincetown worked during the winter under very cold and difficult circumstances. Um, at the work center, Dickinson kept out the coal with canvases that he tacked to the wall for insulation. Um, and even at the work center when it was Day's lumber yard, the bins were unheated and uh, artists managed somehow, uh, even right through to the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, to work in these particular bins. I had the privilege of working in one of these bins uh, before it was remodeled <coughs> for a couple of summers. And every one of us uh, who I talked to who did that remembers the birds in their nests, um, falling out of their nests and onto the floor in front of, in front of you. And I mean, what am I going to do now? <laughs> Is it an omen? <laughs> Motherwell loved his barn studio at the Fine Arts Work Center. You can see the picture of it, and the barn still exists. He said, the barn was beautiful to the whole then shingled with arched barn doors on each floor, which I incorporated on the street side of my present studio house at 631 Commercial Street. Windows on all sides, 
with radiant summer light of Provincetown that rivals the Greek islands. Mm -hmm. So studios, each different, are the playing fields where the rules are made up newly every day. The space encourages that. The artist inhabits it and continues to as long as the space remains. And that's why one goes into these studios now where an artist is no longer alive and one feels the presence, the palpable presence in these studios of, of this artist, regardless of how many years seem to have passed. There's always some little thing left and that's one of the things that's so wonderful about some of the photographs, uh, vintage photographs and contemporary photographs. In one especially in David Merrill's uh, section of the uh, museum up at the monument, there is a picture of his black telephone against the wall and uh, a, uh, a telephone book uh, open on the table. And he paints that black telephone just the way it was. And the painting and the photograph are there. Uh, many of us use the studio uh, for subject matter as well. The show allows us to imagine these spaces and how they were used. It adds that extra factor to our understanding of the artist and perhaps the work. We can always see the work in another location, in a museum, in a gallery, in a home. The artist first saw it in the studio. I'd like to read two poems, and I hope I'm forgiven for my, for my important reading. One is by Stanley Kunitz, called Chariot. It's for Barjan Bogosian. In this image of my friend's studio where curiosity runs the shop, and you can almost smell the nostalgic dust settling on the junk of lost mythologies, the artist himself stays out of view. Yet anyone could guess this is a magician's place. From his collection of conical hats and the sprawled puppets on a shelf, the broken as well as the whole would have grown to resemble him or the other way around. Butterflies, game boards and bells, strewn jacks and alphabet blocks, spindles, old music scores, the litter spreads from wall to wall. If you could dig to the bottom, you might expect to find a child's plush heart, a shining agate eye. Here everything waits to be renewed. That horse age wagon wheel, propped in the corner against an empty picture frame, even in its state of disrepair, minus three spokes, looks poised for flight. Tomorrow, maybe at the crack of a whip, a flock of glittering birds will perch on its rib. A burnished stranger, wearing an enigmatic mask, will mount its hub, and the great battered wheel will start to spin. <laughs> Cluttered studios. But this is a very different image of a studio. Oh. I didn't get around to the notion of a scholar's studio in China. And studios all over the world are, are different because of the actual practices that were occasioned uh, in them. But this is a poem of Gail Major. Uh, related, I think, to me, still. <laughs> it's a part of a poem that's entitled, in, in her collective, entitled Questions. And I think there are five parts, right? Are there five parts? Five parts. Each begins with the same question. What is my purpose in life? What is my purpose in life now that it's too late for regret? Now that I've apologized to the murdered dead and the ones who went with tubes and needles on ungiving rubberized beds and the ones who left glowing, lovers holding their thin, cold hands, compassionate angels hovering in the Swedish light of candles, snow folding itself gently outside over the dry summer gardens, soothing the street lights and the angular cars and hybrids. What can I want now but to be solitary in a white cell with only a mattress and a table and my soul simplifying as Thoreau advised. 
simplifying as Thoreau advised, I know I want one thing on my wall, a framed poem of Li Bo's. The Chinese characters say the moon is making him homesick, drunk, and lonely. I want five things on my table, a block of blue woven paper, a brush, a stone brush rest in the shape of the four sacred mountains. I want to look at a Chinese rock, small and violent as my soul. Mountainous, mountainous as the landscape of Huelin, vertical jade hairpins. And then a gold and red pagoda, a ceramic music box. When I wind the key, it will play a folk song I've heard only once on ancient instruments years ago as I sat on a carved bench watching huge golden carp swimming madly in the miniature lake of a scholar's garden in Suzhou. It will play in perfect time for a while until it winds slowly down, and then the dying song will pull me mercifully back to my calm and penitent mood. Thank you. Uh, 